for November. Does this seem different than um, the voter suppression that we have seen in other election cycles? So I, I want to begin by saying thank you so much for including me in this conversation. And I want to issue set what voter suppression is, because I think it helps people contextualize what's happening now versus what's happened before. Voter suppression is any time you are prevented from or discouraged from voting. It's not about whether they try to get you to vote for one person over the other. That's just politics. But the machinery of democracy, the act of electing someone, you should not be prevented or discouraged from doing so if you are a citizen who holds that right. And the architecture of voter suppression has three forms. Can you register and stay on the rolls? Can you cast your ballot? And does your ballot get counted? And so under registration, it's are there hurdles that you have to jump through to even register to vote? If you live in Texas during COVID-19, the major hurdle is that a lot of the DMVs, a lot of the places you would normally register shut down. And Texas is the largest state in the nation that will not permit online registration. So they've made it difficult to get on the rolls. Georgia and Ohio have a strong reputation for purging voters. So you can't stay on the rolls here. And so if you look across the country, different states have taken up tactics to make it harder to register and stay on the rolls. The second category is, can you cast a ballot? That is impeded when you have a voter ID law that's impossible or difficult to meet. And you hear this narrative, oh, you have to have, a, you have, to have an ID to buy a beer. It's actually easier to buy a beer than it is to execute a constitutional right in some states. Because for example, in the state of Wisconsin, they passed a voter ID law that sent a 100 year old black woman home without being able to vote because she couldn't produce an original birth certificate because she was born during segregation and it was unlawful for her to get that certificate. So even though they, she could show them the census she was in in 1930, in 2016, she was suddenly told she wasn't eligible to vote. And so we have to understand that restrictive voter ID laws are voter suppression. It is not about, can you prove who you are? It's, can you prove who you are jumping through the hoops they want to set? It's also the closure of polling places. If you look in Wisconsin, where in Milwaukee, in the midst of COVID-19 in April, they shut down all but five polling places, which may not sound bad until you realize that the last election, they had 180 of them. In Georgia, they shut down so many polling places, we had eight hour lines. And we saw the same thing happen in Kentucky when folks were be beating on the door of the Civic Center, begging to come in to cast their ballot. So if the polling places shut down, you can't cast your ballot. And what we're facing right now with absentee ballots, mail and voting is who can access it and under what conditions. And then the third is, does your ballot get counted? We know that blacks and Latinos are twice as likely to have their absentee ballots rejected. That young people are five times more likely to have those ballots rejected. And we know that provisional ballots are disproportionately given to poor people, especially black and brown poor people, and that people are given disinformation. And so your ballot doesn't count. The reason I give that architecture to answer this question is this has always been there. For the last 20 years, these rules have been, they've been perfecting these rules. They've been tightening the rules. But for the last 20 years, starting with Georgia and Indiana in 2005, introducing restrictive voter ID, you know, with the crescendo of the evisceration of the Voting Rights Act in 2013 that just opened the floodgates, we have seen new and different versions of the same story. So it's not that it's worse this year maybe than before, because we fixed some things and th some things have gotten worse. What's different is we know. And knowledge is what is causing the, the panic. Because in years past, what has been so effective about voter suppression is it just like, it looked like administrative rules and it looked like user error. Individuals who've been trying to traverse these obstacles for decades have been taught that it was just them. It was their fault. If you were smarter, if you paid more attention, if you were willing to do the work, you could vote. What we know now and what we should have known for years if we'd been willing to talk about it out loud is that voter suppression is built into the de democratic system of America. It was there when we started, is there today, but the difference is they're no longer hiding their hands the way they have for the last 20 years. We have the president of the United States preaching voter suppression. The last time we saw something this egregious, it was during Jim Crow. And so what we have today is the public announcement of and the public confirmation of 
what millions of black and brown folks could tell you has existed for years, which is that voter suppression is real and it matters more in this moment because it's an existential crisis and because we now see their dirty hands manipulating the system.